أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم إن شاء الله proceeding on with uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq's uh, era in the series of the Prophet Muhammad عليه الصلاة والسلام's legendary military legacy uh, we reached a part of uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq's correspondence with Khalid ibn al-Walid رضي الله عنه Uh, and Khalid is sending him a letter to uh, practically ease his mind in terms of uh, what has transpired in the aftermath of the battle of Yamama. So when Abu Bakr Siddiq reads Khalid's letter, he softened his stance somewhat and was further encouraged to excuse Khalid ibn al-Walid when a group of men from the Quraysh stood up to defend Khalid ibn al-Walid. One of them, Abu Burza al-Aslami radiallahu anhu said, O Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, Khalid ibn al-Walid is not a man who can be described with either of the qualities of cowardice or treachery. He did utmost to achieve martyrdom. He was patient until he achieved victory and agree in agreeing to a truce with them in something he wanted. And in, in this regard, he was not wrong. Also, you should remember that when he saw a group of women in the fortress, he thought that they were men. Abu Bakr replied, you have spoken the truth. What you have said Better excuses Khalid than do the contents of the letter that he sent to me. Abu Bakr Siddiq's reaction to both Khalid's letter and Abu Burzakh's comments certainly put the matter to rest. Khalid ibn al-Walid was innocent of any wrongdoing in Yamama. He remained true to the, his cause and at the same time he had every right to marry Mujah's daughter. Certain recent historians have revived the issue in, in order to undermine or in an underhanding manner, underhanded manner, excuse me, whether they did that on purpose or without malicious intent is not the point. The point is that they distort facts and portrayed a false image of Khalid. For instance, there is no excuse for what Dr. Muhammad Hussein Akkal said, even though his ostensible aim was to defend Khalid in a siddiq Abu Bakr, Dr. Haikal wrote, And what did the daughter of Mujaz matter in relation to the yearly celebration that should be enacted in memory of Khalid and his many victories on the battlefield? He was nothing more than a sacrifice that was tossed. She was nothing more than a sacrifice that was tossed towards the feet of a man who can be described as both a military genius and a great conqueror. After all, he is the one who caused blood to flow throughout Yamama so that perhaps it might become purified of its filth, end quotes. What kind of nonsense is this? What was Dr. Haikal's thinking when he wrote these words, words which insinuate that Khalid was like an ancient Greek warrior who fought for glory, fame, riches, or power, or that he was like the god of the Nile River, whom the Egyptians believed was willing to, to give who Egyptians believe was willing to give them as of his bounties only if they cast into his river the most beautiful women among them. In reality, Khalid ibn al-Walid did not have any delusions of grandeur. He did not feel that he was entitled to any special privileges. Rather, he radiallahu anhu was a warrior worshiper, a true believer who had Faith in the oneness of Allah, he fought not for glory or power, but in order to raise the word of Allah above all else. For his efforts, he desired no worldly reward, and he expected neither gratitude nor recognition from any human being. General Akram also erred in his explanation of Khalid's marriage. He attributed the marriage to Khalid's physical strength and excellent physical qualities, and that made him a source of temptation to many beautiful women throughout the Arabian Peninsula. General Akram thus portrayed Khalid as being an ancient Don Juan, a man whose main occupation in life was the pursuit of romantic encounters with women. General Akram's insinuation is, of course, false. Khalid was a warrior whose main occupation in life was fighting for the cause of al-Islam. One thing we do learn from Dr. Haikal and General Akram is how easy it is to distort the reality of a situation with false and blaseless insinuations. Khalid fought for the cause of Allah and he desired rewards from no one else save Allah. During battles, he did everything he could to achieve martyrdom, fighting not just alongside his Muslim brothers. 
but all by himself in front of the Muslim army from Troy. For example, when he advanced ahead of every other Muslim soldier on the day of Buzakha, the soldiers exclaimed, By Allah, Allah, verily you are our leader and you should not advance ahead of all of us. He replied, By Allah, I do not know what you are saying. I advance ahead of all only because I did not think that I could patiently wait. And because I feared that the Muslims would be defeated. And when Khalid advanced ahead of the Muslim army on the day of Yamama, he fought with a great deal of skill and bravery, killing all those who came across his path. Victory and martyrdom were the two main things for which Khalid worked and struggled throughout his life. A leader of an army usually oversees the proceedings of a battle from a nearby hill or command center. As for Khalid, even though... He was the overall commander of the Muslim army. He fought with the enemy in the most dangerous situations. Khalid himself described a painful encounter he had with one of the soldiers of Musaylama. I was in the garden of death as when one of their men grabbed onto me. As a result, both of us fell off of our horse. Then he fell onto and then we fell onto one another on the ground. I stabbed him with a dagger that was attached to my sword, and he stabbed me with a pick that was attached to his sword. In fact, he repeatedly stabbed me all in all, inflicting me seven, inflicting all in all, inflicting upon me seven wounds. In spite of the pain, I continued to push down with my dagger in till finally his body still in the grip of my hand relaxed, thus I signaling his death. I could not move because of my wounds, and blood poured freely from my body. Nonetheless, he died, and I remained alive, and I praise and thank Allah for that. There is one more thing that Khalid made, radiallahu anhu, an effective military man. There is one more thing that made Khalid radiallahu anhu an effective military man. He never underestimated his enemy. And he always gave them credit for their good qualities. For instance, he acknowledged the bravery of his opponents from Banu Hanifa tribe when he said, I witnessed the enemy, example people of Banu Hanifa advancing 20 times. I never saw a people that more patiently endured the blows of swords, nor did I ever encounter a people who knew how to use swords better than they did, and I never witnessed a people who were more steadfast on battlefield than were the children of Hanifa on the day of Yamama. That day, because of the many wounds which I was afflicted, I was not able to move. I reached a point that I lost hope of living and became certain of my death. Inshallah, now we're going to go into uh, page number 516, which is seventh, an assassination attempt on Khalid ibn al-Walid and the Banu Hanifa delegation visits Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in al Madina. No matter how many clear proofs are shown to them, some people simply will not change. Falsehood is a way of life for them. Such people will continue to fight against al-Islam until they are defeated at which point. They turn from open displays of hostility to secret plot and deception. This was the case regarding a man named Salama ibn Umayr al-Hanafi. His people were defeated during the battle of Yamama. His leader was killed and all of his remaining fellow tribesmen repented and returned to al-Islam. And yet he remained the same, fierce in his determination to fight against al-Islam and the Muslims altogether. After Khalid agreed to a truce with the people of Banu Hanifa, Sal Sal Salama waited to show his opposition to the peace agreement, wanted to sh wanting to show his opposition to the peace agreement, excuse me, decided to make an attempt on Khalid's life. Before he could do anything, however, his plans became known to others and he was promptly arrested. He then made a vow to his fellow tribesmen that he would never again think about carrying out such an evil plan. But he soon escaped and broke his vow. Having decided that he was going to try once more to kill Khalid, he probably did not have much of a plan, for he was quickly spotted by Khalid's guards who called out for help. Then the people of Banu Hanifa, not wanting to be held accountable for Salama's actions, responded quickly to the guards' cry for help. They pursued Salama and showed no mercy to him, since he had already once been warned about his evil plans as they were attacking him. He fell into a well and died. Salama's story is a good example of how some people defend falsehood no matter how many clear proofs are presented to them and no matter how many chances they are given to repent. 
The Banu Hanifa delegation, when a delegation from Banu Hanifa visited Al Madina, Bakr Siddiq said to them, Let us bear some of Musaylama's, let us hear some of Musaylama's Quran. The conflict was over, in quotes. The conflict was over, Musaylama had died, and the people of Banu Hanifa had repented for having followed Musaylama and so feeling somewhat ashamed. The delegate said, Will you not excuse us from having to do so, O Khalifa of Allah's Messenger? Abu Bakr replied, It is something you must do. They said, He used to say, O frog, daughter of two frogs, neither water do you spoil nor a drink do you prevent from, from drinking. Your head is in water and your tail is in mud. Musaylama claimed that the words were a part of the Qur'an that was revealed to him. It is related also. It is related that after hearing a number of other similar ridiculous sayings, Abu Bakr said to the delegates, Woe upon you, to, to, to what low places did you manage to take your minds? To what low places did you manage to take your minds? Various historical accounts point to how Musaylama tried to imitate Take the Prophet والسلام, as much as possible. For instance, upon hearing about how the Messenger of Allah spit in a well after which its water became abundant, Musaylama decided to conduct an experiment. He too spit into a well, but the results of his spitting were different. Rather than become filled with water, the well went dry. When he spit into another well, its water became bitter and salty. Musaylama, the liar, was the opposite of bless. Once when he performed ablution, he took the water he used to wash himself and poured it onto the roofs of a date palm tree. Shortly thereafter, the tree became dry and then died. On another occasion, he took a group of children and tried to bless them by passing his hand over their head. Some of them developed a lisp in their speech and others among them became bald. And on yet another occasion, Musaylama supplicated for a man whose eyes bare became irritated. Musaylama then passed his hands over the man's eyes. By now, the leader, oh, I'm sorry, by now the reader can probably guess what happened next. The man, instead of being cured, he became blind. Uh, we're on to the next point, uh, the gathering of the Qur'an, page number 518. When the Prophet والسلام, had died, the Qur'an was not gathered in a single book. Instead, parts of it were with different people on leather parchments, on bones, and on the hearts of men. And so were many of the companions who passed away, who had memorized the Qur'an on a day of Yamama, their loss signified much more than the departure of the noble and pious Muslims. It signified a possible tragedy that would, if it occurred, outweigh all other tragedies. The loss of the Qur'an, or at least the loss of some of its ayahs and surahs. This is because the Prophet ﷺ's companions were likely to fight in many more battles against apostates and disbelievers. And if they too were going to die on the battlefield, particularly those among them that had the Qur'an memorized in its entirety, then the greatest strategy of all, the one I just referred to, was likely to occur, that they would lose the entire Qur'an. The first person to perceive not only the danger of the situation but also the necessity of taking immediate and decisive action was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Shortly after the battle of Yamama took place, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was summoned for Zaid ibn al-Thabit al-Ansari to come to him. When Zaid went to Abu Bakr, he saw Umar ibn al-Khattab sitting down beside him. Abu Bakr then said to Zaid, Rarely Umar has come to me and said, Many of the Qur'an, those that have memorized the Qur'an, have died on the day of Yamama, and I fear that many other Qur'ans will die. Many of those who bear the Qur'an will also die in future battles and conflicts. And the dangerous results of that will be the loss of much of the Qur'an. Therefore, I think that you should order someone or 
some committee of people to gather the Quran from what is written of it on leather parchments and bones and from what is preserved in the hearts of men. I said to Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, how can I do something that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do himself? Umar said radiallahu anhu, by Allah, this is something good that you must do. Umar continued to come back to me with the same advice until Allah opened my heart to the same idea to which Allah had opened Umar's heart. And regarding the gathering of the Qur'an, I came to hold the same opinion that, Umar's hold, that Umar holds. Up until that, this point, Zaid probably had no idea what was coming next. He, radiallahu anhu, was about to be assigned the greatest and most important mission of his entire life. Abu Bakr Siddiq went on to say, Verily, you are a young man who is wise and intelligent. And we have nothing to accuse you of. And you used to write down revelation for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, search out for the various parts of the Quran and gather them all into one book. They replied by Allah, had you charged me with the task of moving a mountain from one place to another, you would have not have placed a greater burden than you have placed on me upon me now by ordering me to gather the Quran. Zayd radiallahu anhu later said, I then searched out for the various parts of the Quran, finding them preserved on palm branches on the surface of flat stones in the hearts of men on pieces of leather and on the shoulder bones of camels or sheep. I continued to search out for the Quran until I found the last part of Surah Tawbah with Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari, a part of the Quran which I did not find with anyone else. The part that says, بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوثُ الرَّحِيمِ Verily, there has come unto you a messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from amongst yourself. It grieves him that you should receive any injury or difficulty. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is anxious over you to be rightly guided. Rightly guided to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg him to pardon and forgive your sins in order that you may enter paradise and be saved from the punishment of the hellfire. For the believers, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is full of pity, kind and mercy. The gathered scrolls, scrolls of the Quran stayed with Abu Bakr Siddiq until he died and then with Umar until he died, after which they were passed on to Habs bint Umar. Inshallah, we will, we will uh, stop here and pick it up in uh, the following, in the next video. This is page number 520. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, we will consume the uh, or we will we will continue. In other words, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa tabarakas murabbik wa taala jaduk wa la ilaha ghairuk wa la hawla wa la quwwat illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Subhanak Rabbi Rabbi al-Azza al-Nasifun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.